we talked about what wisdom is and where uh, we find that in the Bible. And then we took a little trip to visit Solomon um, who asked for wisdom and we got to see what he did with godly wisdom. So we call that wisdom in action. And so um, the title of tonight's message, and this is the fifth installment in the Choose Wisely series, is Wisdom Back in Action. Um, if any of you were, have been football fans for the past, um, we'll say, 10 years, then you may remember <laughs> you may remember the brief, very brief, career of a fella who was the quarterback for the Washington football team, whatever you want to call them. Um, uh, his name was Robert Griffin III, RG3. He was going to be the, the savior of the franchise, and he had an amazing half of a season. Um, and then he tore, tore his ACL, and they, they – try to put him back together with some duct tape and bubble gum and put him back out there and the poor guy couldn't hardly move. And then everybody for the next, however long, however many months the off season is in football, everybody was wondering, will he come back? Can he come back? When will he come back? And then the season started and he came back. And we're not sure what he did with the other, the former version of himself, but he never it never came back. He was not nearly as good after that injuries, notwithstanding, or possibly um, still at play. But um, we were so everybody was so excited to uh, see him back in action that we ignored that for the first few games and then it just started to get worse and worse and worse and we knew that things weren't going the right direction. However, when we're talking about wisdom, it is always effective when put into action. Uh, it doesn't matter what you've been through, what you feel like your wisdom has been through, uh, what kind of shape you feel like you are in um, regarding wisdom, whether or not you have a lot, whether or not you have a little, whether or not you, your wisdom is really wisdom. We're going to figure that out, and we're going to see wisdom back in action tonight in another story in God's Word. Before we do that, I just want to remind you of what definition we are using um, as we talk about wisdom here. And that is that wisdom is the most appropriate and effective use of the knowledge of truth according to your situation. So it's the truth of, from, truth, it's truth from God applied in the best way according to the situation that you need it for, okay? And we talked about the difference over the past uh, three weeks, two weeks, um, between man's wisdom and God's wisdom. Man's, you see the difference there, one, the two different columns. Uh, man's wisdom is self-centered. God's, God's wisdom is God-centered. Man's wisdom is self-sourced. God's is God-sourced. Man's wisdom is self-reliant. God's is God-reliant. Man's wisdom is self-glorifying. God's wisdom is God-glorifying. Man's wisdom says that the cross of Jesus Christ and that the whole story, the good news of Jesus coming to die on the cross for our sins and rising again to give us eternal life with him, it says that that whole thing is foolishness. But God's wisdom says that the cross is wisdom. It's the wisdom that gives us understanding of who we are and who God is and who Jesus is and what he did to make us children of God forever. So we stopped there uh, last week, and we're going to kind of uh, stop there. We're going to go one, one step further at the end of this message. But one of the things that I wanted to, to remind you of is some is a couple of the points that we talked about last week. And that is that God's wisdom, and go back here, God's wisdom, started with man's wisdom. Man's wisdom is self reliant. God's wisdom is God reliant. Man's wisdom is self glorifying. God's wisdom is God glorifying. <clears throat> so we talked about the fact that if you're trying to figure out which, how you're thinking and which one you're using, see who it's glorifying. <laughs> 
Is it something, is it, is it a pattern of thinking and action that is um, pump, puffing you up, pumping you up, making you what draw, making the attention drawn to yourself? Or is it something that uh, make, helps you rely upon God, depend upon him desperately and points to his glory? So we, we saw the difference in that in scripture here in Jeremiah chapter 9 verses 23 and 24 where it says, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. So that God wants for our wisdom to be dependent upon him and for him to get the glory as he, as he gives us that wisdom that we need in order to live the lives that he's given us and make the choices that we have to make. Also, in the book of Proverbs, it gives us many more than these, but these are three that I picked that point to the fact that the glory is for God and because the wisdom is from him. Proverbs 19, 21 says, There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. Proverbs 16, 1 says, The preparations of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. And Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And I bet that if we went around the room tonight, we could probably all give testimony to the fact when when we had plans made. We had our minds made up. We had seen our situations and inserted our wisdom and said, this is what is going to, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what's going to happen. And God said, that's nice. And then he showed us what was really going to happen. I've told you all probably more times than you care to hear about the time of my decision-making process for going into ministry, for becoming a pastor. Um, that was not my plan. I, I had other plans. I was actually in law school when I, I made that final decision and God let me go and he let me see where my plans were leading, how things would go, where I, where it would end up. And at least to the best degree that I could at that point in time. And I realized, wow, my heart has planned its way and it is not pleased with where it's going. Not that I was doing anything wrong. I wanted to do good things with, with that occupation. But God wanted me to follow him in, in, in complete obedience and complete surrender to his will by, being his, by serving him in ministry. And so my heart definitely planned my way, but it, was, it took God's um, wisdom to direct my steps and he did and he does for us faithfully and we need to be we need to recognize that because a lot of times we will plan our way and regardless of what happens we still are determined to follow our way and we need to check up sometimes and say you know what um what i'm experiencing here that's not the of, of things not going my way might just be god saying hey I've got the best way. Why don't you follow me? Um, and I know sometimes it's hard to discern that, whether or not it's you know just difficulty that we have to push through or, or God trying to get our attention. But I will tell you this in regards to that. God is the best communicator that there's ever been and ever will be. And he is perfectly able and faithful to let us know uh, when we are following our path and he wants to redirect us into his. And he wants you to trust him for that, not try to figure out all the all the um, all the deets uh, about it, as uh, as we say, but just to trust him to sort those steps out for you. Um, don't worry about the details. Uh, just do what you know to do. All right. I should say, don't worry about the details that you don't know. Worry, just do what you know God wants you to do. So. We talked about the reliance is upon, is upon God and the glory is for him. And that's important because this comes up very quickly in our story of wisdom and action tonight. So 
Let, let's look at Judges chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, and see what's going on here. I'll give you the background. Gideon is someone that God has called to lead his people to victory over their enemies, on um, the Midianites and some others that joined them because the Midianites were um, coming and st stealing the food and resources that the Israelites had. And God was allowing them to do that because the Israelites were following false gods. They were worshiping idols. They were sacrificing the idols. They had built these monuments to gods that weren't even real and had, forsaken, had just turned their back on the one true God. And so God says, all right, I'm going to offer you some correction here. And um, I'm going to allow these people to come and, and, and do this to you. And then he leads Midi uh, Midi Gideon um, against the Midianites uh, to, uh, tear down the, uh, to tear down the altars that the people of Israel had built up that were false and to conquer the Midianites that were um, coming against them. And so at this point in time, Gideon is very much in the center of God's will. He is also very unpopular with a lot of his uh, people because he tore down their altars and stuff that they really liked. Um, and we don't really, you know, think about that stuff a whole lot, but there, we have stuff that may be idols in, in, in our lives or, or has the potential to be idols. And if somebody came in and took that stuff, we'd be upset. So, for instance, if you got home tonight and all of your televisions were in a pile of, like, rubble, in the middle of your living room, every one of you, with a note, a little uh, post-it note stuck on it that says, God loves you, Pastor Shane. Um, I bet that you would call me to thank me for um, taking down that which could have possibly been an idol for you. You all would do that, right? You would call, it's Pastor Appreciation Month, and you would call me with great appreciation to say, thank you so much. No, you'd be like, uh... What's going on, man? Why'd you do that? And that's what they were doing with Gideon. So Gideon is serving God. He's struggling with his people, but he gets enough of them to convince that he is following God and that God is on their side so that they have an army to f face the Midianites. And they're, I forget how, they're still greatly outnumbered by the Midianites, but they feel good because they've got a lot, a much bigger crowd than they than they had just, you know, months before. So starts off with Judge, picks up in Judges seven, chapter seven by saying this. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, that was his nickname they gave him because he tore down the ba altars of, of Baal. And all the people who are with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Harad, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them, by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord God said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. In other words, God looks at Gideon and says, hey, he says, man, that's really a great crowd of people you got here to, to fight. Gideon's like, yeah, no, I just can't believe it. God's like, okay, good. That's Yeah, it's great. Now get rid of them. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, God. I'm not sure you understand how this works. If you have a big group of people, you need a big group of people to fight against them. It's called it's called battle with, between armies. And God's like, yeah, I know what it is. And I'm telling you that if you take this many Israelites, even though I believe they're outnumbered about four to one here, I'd have to go back and, and check that to be sure. If you If you go out with this many and I let them win, they're not going to say, to God be the glory, they're going to say, we are the champions, or something to that effect. And then God says, and I, and I really don't like that song, so I'd rather hear them say, to God be the glory. <clears throat> and so um, God says, you got to get rid of some of these some of these soldiers, these men that have come to fight with you and for me. And so immediately we get a glimpse of, into God's wisdom, and we see the application of his wisdom, and it is contrary to ours. Because God's wisdom says here, remember, God's wisdom says, God's wisdom is God-reliant and God-glorifying. 
And God says, if I send them into battle with as many people as they have, they're going to win and they're going to give themselves credit. They're going to learn only to rely upon themselves and they're going to give them themselves all the glory and they'll be no closer to following me, obeying me, enjoying me, trusting me than they were before this whole thing shook out. So God says, you got to have fewer people than you have so that they, so that they will trust and glorify me. So that's the glory. That's God glorifying wisdom there. It goes against the man glorifying wisdom that was saying the more people, the better so that we can have a chance um, to trust in our trust in our numbers to fight. And so um, again, God says to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the many nights in their hands. Lest Israel, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me saying, my own hand to save me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from, from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. So, all Jeremiah does is turn around and say, Hey, anybody that wants to go home, you can go home. But I know you don't want to because you guys showed up to fight. And they're like, See, twenty-two thousand over two thirds of the of the army just just walks off, just walks off. At least it went ten thousand, and now he's really outnumbered, and now he's got to be discouraged because their numbers are so diminished. And he looks out over the um, the distance and sees that big army of Midianites over there, and he sees turns around. And he sees his army marching the other direction to leave and go home. And they, and he's got to be thinking, this is, this is, this is stupid. This is unwise. I have chosen unwisely. But remember, he's following God's wisdom, not man's. And then God goes on to up the stakes a little bit. Verse four, it says, but the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that who, of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. Now God is very pointedly making the selection. He is, he is intrinsically involved in the selection process. And he says, I'm going to, so he basically says to Gideon, this is what, the way this is going to work. I'm going to point at people and they can't be in the army. And it's kind of like when you have tryouts for football or basketball or whatever you want to play and you're waiting for them to call your name as to whether or not you're on the team or, or you, you know, better luck next year, fella. Um, and he basically tells Gideon, I'm going to call a roll and whoever I call um, is going to be on the team in your army and her, and whoever I don't call um, is going to be sent home. So let's see what how this shakes out. So he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall sit apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. So God said, this is how we're going to divide them up. If somebody laps with the water with his tongue, in other words, he gets down on all fours, puts his face in the water, and well, you know how a dog drinks. I won't do it because um, I don't want to scare any of you. Um, then he says, you shall set apart him by himself. And everyone who gets down on his knees to drink, so everybody who got down on a knee, scooped the water with his hand and, and drank it, um, we would set them apart. Um and then it says in verse six, and the number of those who lapped putting their hands to their mouth, not like a dog, but like I said, was 300 men. And you know, at that point, Gideon has got to be, got to be going, all right, I can do without 300. That's the, you know, I, as long as it's not another, you know, 22,000, I, I, you know, another two thirds of the army, I can, I can do without 300. And it says, but all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. The Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who left, I will save you. Gideon's like, no, God, I think, you, I think you messed up because the ones that did this 
go are going to go home 300 of them and the other 9700 will stay here right god no by the 300 men who lapped i will save you and deliver the midianites into your hand let all the other people go every man to his place so the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands and he sent away all the rest of israel every man to his tent and retained those 300 men now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. And we're going to stop right there That with this, with this story tonight um, and uh, this part of the story anyway because you, you may have heard this story before, maybe you haven't, but it's one of my favorites because it's God showing us Pointedly, the difference between our wisdom and his. If we reverse the story and put ourselves in God's place, the story would probably go something like this. Gideon had 32,000 men, and I thought that wasn't enough, so I multiplied it times three, and you get 96,000 men. Whew, that was close. I just couldn't do that in my head. Mm -hmm. Only 96,000 men. And then as the day gets closer and the army is, you know, that, that army or there is experienced. So, you know, they might have 80,000 and I'm just using that as a, as a figure. They might have 80,000 and we've got 92, but I really want to make sure that we're going to be on the winning side of this and be able to really have some people left over to celebrate the victory. So I'm going to go ahead and double what we already have. And so you get 96 times two, which is exactly. And, um, and so now you got this massive army and you, and you're still a little, um, you know, reticent going into battle. And so you think to yourself, well, it'd be really neat if we had some artillery and everybody's like, what's artillery? And they're like, it hasn't been invented yet, but I'm going to, um, I'm going to pray down some that we can, so that we can, um, launch missiles and cannon fire at the Midianites. You see where I'm going with this? Our way of thinking would have been get more people, get more weapons, get more advantage for ourselves. And God says, you're starting in the wrong place. Where you need to start is, do I have God? Do I have God? And we, as we talked about last week, the way that we know that we have God and God has us is because of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's done and our belief in him. Our belief in the fact that he is God who came to earth, who lived a perfect life, who died on the cross for our sins, who uh, rose again and who God says to everyone who believe, or who, for everyone who, who received him, to those God gave the right to be called children of God. And when you're a child of God, then, then yes, you've got God. And then you, you can say to yourself and to anyone else that my God is able to provide all of my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So, if those things are true, then I can rest in that truth, and I can apply it to my situation, and that, my friends, is wisdom. So, if you have an impossible situation, and this is interesting here, because God actually creates an impossible situation. And you think to yourself, well, God wouldn't do that. God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? He wouldn't let me run into any difficulty. <clears throat> God wants you to be holy. Way more so than he wants you to be happy. He went, and by, by that, I mean, he wants you to be dependent upon him, living for him, trusting in him. And so oftentimes he will allow situations in our lives, even orchestrate them, not orchestrate evil, but orchestrate or allow the, the existence of evil in our lives or difficulty or adversity 
so that we can say, I, I, I don't know what else I have or if, if it's even possible for it to work here. But I've got God. And I've got his promise. Uh, he's got me. And with that, I know I can march forward. And that's all that God wanted Gideon and those 300 dudes to believe and the whole nation of Israel to believe by seeing that. And a lot of times we want to say that we are really, 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 really um, relying on God. And I think that God looks at us and he says, um, I'm going to make that true. And so when Jesus was here, he said some, some things that didn't make sense to people. And they, they barely make sense to us now even sometimes. But they didn't make sense then and we struggle to make sense of them now because... he was seeing things with perfect God wisdom and we're still processing things through our man wisdom. So Jesus said some weird stuff like blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the, in other words, blessed are those who are downcast and, and desperate and without um, external and possibly internal hope. And so if I said to you tonight, Brothers and sisters, I figured out a way for you to be blessed. It's for you to lose everything and be completely distraught internally. You would say, that sounds stupid. Just like Gideon was probably tempted to do when God says, take those 300 guys to fight that army. Because it doesn't sound wise. And yet what Jesus was saying when he was talking about that in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, if you want to look that up later on, what he was saying was people who know they're in a situation where they must desperately depend upon God, they're, they are blessed because they don't have all the human self-reliance and rebellion and resistance to God that's been been defeated possibly by their situation and they realize that they are hopeless and helpless and so they are desperate and dependent and because of that they look to God and say not just you're all I need but you're all I got. You're all I got. And I believe that's where God wants to, us to exist, live for him. I don't mean that God is going to, uh, you know, just go scorched earth in every one of our lives and, and minds and hearts so that we will depend upon him. What I do mean is that sometimes he does some of that. More often than not, what he does is make is use those things, but other many other things as well, particularly his Holy Spirit within us, to transform us, to be dependent upon him and desperate for him. Because you all know, you might have everything this world has to offer and all the wisdom that could come from a man and still be completely empty, hopeless, helpless, lost apart from God. And so Jesus is simply saying to Gideon, and he's saying to those people when he told them that they were blessed because they were poor in spirit. And he's saying to us tonight, 
that the best thing you can be as a human being is dependent upon God Almighty. The best thing you can be as a human being is dependent on, on God Almighty. And his wisdom proves that out in stories like this one. I'll go ahead and give you the, um, the synopsis of the rest of the story. Gideon takes his 300 men. They make a circle around the army of the Midianites during the night. They um, light. They have torches under under pitchers. They blow the trumpets, break the torch, break the pitchers, and so the Midianite army wakes up, sees these people all around them, all these lights around them, and they think it's a massive army that's already surrounded. So they so they go berserk, pull out their swords, start running around, and they, they all kill each other. And the and the battle is won. And it only took 300 men. And what God's trying to prove out to us, I think, is that it could have been one man. It could have been no man. It could have, they could have, Gideon could have had nothing. He could have had no arms to hold his sword, no legs to march into battle. And yet God would have made a way through his wisdom. And he does that. Now, I understand that God in his wisdom, uses the abilities he's given to us. But he uses the wisdom also that he gives to us. So that we can say not, oh, thank you, God, that I'm so smart, that I'm so capable, that I'm so strong, that I'm so whatever, but so that we can say, thank you, God, for giving me everything that I have, including your wisdom, um, that I may use it for you. And so Gideon and those guys can say, thank you, God, for, um, you know, making 300 of us and, and giving us this amazing idea of using um, trumpets and, I mean, pitchers and torches instead of, you know, the artillery that we were going to call in um, before. Um, in the book of Isaiah, God says it uh, this way. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. In other words, man's wisdom. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Sure, why can you keep disappearing? Uh, Gwen. Can you please click on the last slide? It just disappeared on me. Well, so much for that. So without any further suspense, this that is the passage that ends up with God saying, For my for your thoughts are not my thoughts, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. For from as for my thoughts are higher than yours, and um, help me out. What, what, my way, my ways are higher than yours. So it's God saying to us, "Your wisdom um, and everything else." Okay, we're, we're live. All right, here we go. Let's try this again. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. My uncle gave to me a book when I graduated from high school <clears throat> that I still haven't read, but it had an awesome title. And that title is When God Doesn't Make Sense. When God Doesn't Make Sense. And it's by Dr. James Dobson. I, I remember I remember staring at the cover of that book many, many times and thinking, sounds about like my life. And I think that we can safely say, when God doesn't make sense, when life does not make sense, when our situations do not make sense, when our jobs don't make sense, when our families don't make sense, when... This world just doesn't make sense. It's okay 